So uh, we got 15 minutes. Well, they told me I can push it to 20. Is it, who? Did they really? Yeah, they did. You guys are getting, getting soft. No, this, that's because it's me. Is that well? That's because I'm the dean. You, I'm the dean of no, the Supreme you're, Court Press no, Board. You're not, Do you know what that means? I'm old. No, you're not. You're not old. Yeah. The, uh, you're, you're trying to okay. use that to get more time, which okay. I understand. I'll use anything I can get. All right. Go ahead. Okay, um, Mr. President, Judge Garland was a uh, runner-up twice before. So why now and not twice before? Well, I think Mary Garland is one of the best judges, uh, not just in the country, but of his generation. And it is a testimony to how good he is that uh, you know, he has cropped up as uh, a potential Supreme Court justice for uh, a very long time. Uh, I have always been a huge admirer of his. Uh, I've always felt that uh, the way he approaches cases, uh, the intellect, the care to follow precedent, the consensus building uh, were qualities that uh, would make him uh, an outstanding uh, Supreme Court justice. This moment in our history, uh, a time when judicial nominations have become so contentious, uh, a time when our politics uh, is so full of vitriol, I think particularly benefits from uh, a man who, by all accounts, is decent, full of integrity, uh, is uh, someone who tries to hear the other side's point of view uh, and can build bridges. And so, uh, although I've always believed that he would make an outstanding Supreme Court justice, uh, it, it is my belief that now more than ever, his voice uh, would serve the court well, uh, would help to uh, burnish the sense that the Supreme Court is above politics and not just an extension of politics, uh, and uh, would set a good tone for uh, r restoring or at least increasing the American people's confidence uh, in our justice system. Did you talk to him about being a pinata, as the Senator Cornyn put it? We had a very ca candid conversation. Uh, you know, he's the chief judge of the D.C. Circuit, so uh, I assume that he either reads uh, the Washington Post or listens to NPR, and uh, I think had a pretty good sense of the uh, posture that Majority Leader McConnell took immediately after uh, Justice Scalia's passing, uh, the notion that uh, the Republican senators would not consider any nominee, no way, no how. Uh, I'm sure that he is aware that these days massive advertising campaigns are mounted in opposition to uh, uh, candidates, not just for Supreme Court, but for appellate court justices. But so, he's, not, he's not a Paul. No, he isn't. And so we discussed that. And I wanted to make sure that uh, not only uh, he felt comfortable with it, but his family felt comfortable with it. Uh, you know, uh, for those of us who are more often in uh, you know, the scrum of politics, uh, we're, we call folks uh, like uh, Judge Garland civilians. And so suddenly being placed in a war zone uh, like this is something that you want to make sure they're uh, they're mindful of, uh, but you know I, I think the way he described it, and and I'll let him, uh, you know, as he talk, makes the rounds with senators, uh, describe it himself. The, the way he described it is that he, uh, he has loved the law for a very long time. He has loved being a judge for a very long time. He occupies. Uh, the most honored position in what is often considered the second most powerful court in the land. He's got a great job, and he is at a stage in his career where, uh, given his confidence in his record, uh, given the uh, reputation that he's built in the legal community, uh, that he is uh, prepared, I think, to take on uh, whatever unfair or unjust or uh, wildly uh, exaggerated uh, claims that may be made by uh, those who are just opposed to uh, 
uh, any nominee that I might make uh, because he thinks it's important. And I, I think he is convinced that he can do a really good job, uh, partly because he has relationships with the judges that are already on the court, and he's shown himself to be a, a consensus builder. And, I, and he believes, rightly, that we're at a time where uh, the more consensus we can forge, uh, the better off we're going to be. By the way, when did you offer him the job? Uh, over the weekend. Mm -hmm. Well, he's a very good actor because I had dinner with him Sunday night, and he looked like he, he kept just was saying he wasn't going to get it. Well, <laughs> you, you know, I, 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 that just shows his wisdom once again because uh, when it comes to things like getting the uh, being nominated for the Supreme Court, it's probably always wise to. Uh, you know, not count your chickens uh, before they're hatched. <laughs> but you just told me they were hatched. Well, <laughs> I, yeah, I'm not sure about that. In the heat I might have called them right after dinner. <laughs> uh, in the heat of a presidential campaign, how do you keep this nomination front and center, alive and prominent in the face of uh, Republicans saying that they won't give your nominee a hearing. They clearly don't want to look rude, so they'll meet with him and tell him that they don't want to meet with him. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, how do you keep it up there? When the Supreme Court, frankly, I've written more pieces in my life saying, this year it may be an issue, and then it never really is. This year it may be an issue. In fact, I think it is in part because of the uh, circus that has been the presidential uh, campaign season so far. Uh, I think people already are troubled by some of the extreme rhetoric that we've seen in the presidential race. I think people already are troubled by the extreme gridlock in Washington. I think people already are concerned about uh, excessive obstructionism that goes beyond uh, uh, principled disagreements but becomes a systematic no to everything. And when you then ha add, uh, add to that uh, a situation in which uh, for the first time in anyone's memory uh, you have the head of the Senate saying I won't meet with a nominee, I won't provide a nominee a hearing, I will not provide a nominee a vote, and that if in fact uh, was maintained would be the first time uh, in the modern court where we would have a seat unfilled for over a year, that matters to people. Uh, and, and so you're right, Nina, that generally speaking people aren't cl closely following Supreme Court cases unless you have a big seminal case like uh, same-sex marriage come down. But people are following the fact that increasingly our political institutions are broken and it troubles them. And this becomes, I think, a symbol of uh, a process that uh, if Republicans stick to their current posture, uh, promises a tit-for-tat process in which we will never have uh, a clean nomination process on the merits, and presidents, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, uh, are only going to be able to get their nominees through when uh, they have their, their own party controlling the Senate. At that point, the judiciary becomes a pure extension of politics, and that damages people's faith in the judiciary because Everybody understands that there's some politics involved in appointing judges, but we also expect that uh, the judicial system can rise above the political process. And so I, uh, you know, we've seen already the surveys that say, number one, people are paying attention to this, and number two, uh, it's not just Democrats, but a sizable number of Republicans uh, who vote against me have said, uh, this is this can't be uh, the way we uh, run, uh, run our government. Uh, and what's particularly ironic is uh, the degree to which uh, a number of people who say they're not going to nominate somebody uh, claim to be people who want fidelity to the Constitution, and 
respect for uh, you know, our founders' intentions. I don't, there's nobody who would suggest that our founders anticipated that uh, a new rule is read into the Supreme Court nomination process in which for an entire year uh, we don't do that because there's an election going on. George Washington nominated uh, a couple of Supreme Court justices uh, in his last year and uh, you know obviously uh, you know George Washington had better poll numbers uh, I'm sure than <laughs> I did but nevertheless if you care about original intent I think uh, you know y y you don't want to see that this becoming degenerating uh, into just a, a pure political battle so uh, we've reported that Republican, leading Republican senators sent a message, sort of back channel. Okay, if you appoint Merrick Garland, we, we still will oppose him now, but we would confirm him in the lame duck session after the election if there's a Democratic president. Did that play any role in your decision? We, I have not had uh, conversations like that. No, I didn't what, say you had. <laughs> what, what, I, what I have seen are the public statements of leading Republicans like Orrin Hatch uh, broadly complimenting Judge Garland as a brilliant, fair jurist who should be confirmed to the Supreme Court. And so did that play a role in your choosing and the fact that Republicans really do like him? Well, the, there's no doubt that what played a role, as I said earlier, was that, number one, I think he's the best person for the job. Number two, I think he's a consensus builder. Uh, and I, the court would benefit from that uh, uh, at the moment. Um, you know, Justice Scalia was a larger-than-life figure, and he helped to shape uh, the dialogue and the debate. Um, but you know, if you think about when the Supreme Court has uh, been held in the highest esteem and has uh, moved the country forward in, in the most powerful of ways, uh, generally it hasn't been divided just along 5-4 votes. Um, and Judge Garland, if you look at his work on the D.C. Circuit, has been able to bring together conservatives, liberals, and move them uh, to find common ground. And I think that's a, a valuable quality. The fact that has been reinforced by the statements uh, that were made by Republicans. Uh, it certainly told me that this is somebody who uh, is widely respected. And I said at the outset, I would not uh, use this appointment as a political symbol, as a way to score points, as a way to gin up uh, my base. Uh, I said I would play it straight, that my goal was to actually confirm a justice who I thought could do an outstanding job, uh, and uh, Merrick Garland uh, fits that bill. Your base, <clears throat> some of them quietly said, you know, everybody on that list except Merrick Garland was a minority or a woman, some of them were both. You picked uh, the oldest person by far, yeah. the only white guy, uh, and he's sort of a centrist liberal. He's not, you know, he's not gonna, this, was our, this is our shot to really change the debate at the Supreme Court. What do you say to that, those folks? Well, first of all, what I would say is take a look at the appointments I've made since I've been President of the United States. Uh, I've appointed uh, as many African Americans to the circuit court as any president ever, more African American women on the federal courts than any other president, more Hispanics, more Asian Americans, more uh, LGBT uh, judges than any president in history. We actually now have a majority of women and or minorities on the circuit courts, uh, something that's never happened before. So uh, my record of appointing uh, a judiciary that reflects the country is unmatched. Um, when it comes to uh, the Supreme Court, I've appointed two women, one Hispanic, 
And in each case, the good news is, is that I appointed the person who I absolutely thought was the best person for the job. In this case, Merrick Garland is the best person for the job. And uh, I have confidence that uh, without knowing how he's going to decide any particular case, he's going to be somebody who understands the law, understands precedent, understands the Constitution, and possesses the values uh, that recognize uh, the unique role of the court in uh, preserving our rights, preserving our liberties, uh, in making sure that uh, the, the powerful get a fair hearing, but that the powerless uh, also uh, ha you know, are heard and uh, have uh, access to justice. What do you ask these folks in your interviews? I mean, you can't say, so what do you think of Roe versus Wade? That right. would be improper, right? I do not do that. So um, I'm Judge Totenberg. I'm, I'm here for my interview. What are you going <laughs> to ask me? They, what kinds of things do you ask? Well, sometimes I just ask about family uh, and background and what made you want to be a judge. Uh, you learn a lot just by talking to people about what their story is. Um, and when you hear Judge Garland's uh, background, when you hear that story about him as a valedictorian speaker, uh, Victorian, uh, valedictorian speaker um, standing up for a fellow student who uh, was about to be censored by the parents, when you hear about the care with which he dealt with the victims, uh, and the, the families who had been affected by the Oklahoma City bombing. You get a sense of who that person is, and uh, I spent a lot of time on that. With respect to judicial philosophy, I, I have the advantage of having taught constitutional law, so uh, I don't need to uh, get into the weeds on uh, their thinking on a lot of these cases because I can just read their opinions and the quality of their work, and uh, I have a pretty good sense of how they approach cases. Um, one thing I, I do ask them is uh, how do they generally approach a problem where uh, the text of the Constitution might be ambiguous? You know, what do they do to, uh, to understand uh, either the meaning of the text uh, you know, do, mm -hmm. To what extent do they draw on uh, historical data? To what extent do they draw on uh, you know, their sense of uh, how society is dealing with that problem today? You know, so you'll get some sense of their judicial philosophy. Um, but most of the time, by the time they uh, get to, to me, um, you know, they've probably gone through a confirmation process before, and they have a pretty good sense of um, what they can talk about and what they shouldn't talk about. Um, let me conclude by asking you a sort of a devil's advocate question. Sure. You've said that um, neither party comes to this process clean. It's absolutely true. And you, you voted to not end debate on the Alito nomination. And if I understood you correctly at your press conference, what I thought I heard you say was, eh, you know, I knew it was, it, that it was a meaningless vote. You got a pass from, from the leadership. You can do this. Um, but can you blame the Republicans who look at this nomination and say, there's going to be a shift in the court if we approve this nominee? And we don't like that shift in the court. So um, can you really blame them for trying to prevent a significant shift in the court, hoping that they'll win the presidential nomination? And if the shoe were on the other foot, wouldn't the Democrats do the same? They call it, they're all already calling it the Biden rule. Well, a couple of things. First of all, uh, this speech that they continually quote from uh, Joe Biden when he was uh, on the Judiciary Committee, uh, if you actually read the speech, number one, he was speaking hypothetically. Uh-oh. Oops. Should we start that one over? Yeah, let's, let's do that. <laughs> wow, Nina, you're supposed not, to turn not, off I'm your phone. I'm supposed to be a pro. Come on. Come on. The, uh, uh, it's the office. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm assuming you can just splice the question, and I'll just uh, yes. answer it. Yeah. So she, uh, Nina doesn't have to answer it. Uh, ask it again. Um, 
Well, first of all, if you look at what Joe Biden actually said many years ago, uh, he was saying, if hypothetically there were to be a Supreme Court opening, uh, then his advice to a president in his last year would be to not make the nomination unless he had consulted widely and arrived at a consensus candidate. Well, you know what? That's exactly what I've done. Uh, and so there's no contradiction between what I'm doing and what Joe Biden suggested a president in my circumstances should do. Number two, uh, with respect to uh, my actions when I was a junior senator, uh, you will recall that I never said that a nominee should not get a hearing. I never said that a nominee should not get a vote. And what I also said at the time was that I was concerned about some of Judge Alito's views that I considered uh, more troubling. But uh, in the case of Merrick Garland, we haven't seen a substantive argument against his jurisprudence. This is just raw politics. We don't want somebody who's been nominated by a Democrat, a claim that I would have never made at the time. Now, what is true, Nina, is, is that uh, you know, we have a divided court on a lot of important issues. Justice Scalia uh, was a big figure who uh, was viewed as uh, you know, providing a majority f on conservative positions on some of the uh, cases that came before the court. Um, and so I understand the politics uh, that Republican senators are dealing with. Uh, and the, the price they would pay if, in fact, uh, they confirmed uh, a nominee. Here's the problem we have, though. If, in fact, we've gotten to the point where uh, they can't confirm somebody because a Democratic president is nominating them, uh, what's to stop them from saying next year, uh, we've got another excuse for not confirming a Democratic president's nominee. Uh, and at that point, the process has broken down. Democrats have not been blameless in this process. You cannot point to me a circumstance in which Democrats have left a seat open when a Republican president uh, was in office uh, simply because they didn't like the possibility that uh, it would change the makeup of the court. Justice Kennedy was confirmed by Ronald Reagan, and I'm quite certain that there were a whole lot of Democratic senators who understood at the time that he was unlikely to favor their positions on a number of issues. But ultimately, he was confirmed, and he was confirmed in the last year of President Reagan's uh, office. So we actually have evidence, we have proof, not that Democrats are perfect, but that they do at a certain point recognize that the process and the sanctity of the Supreme Court and the integrity of the institution, not just the Supreme Court, but the integrity of the Senate and the office of the president requires them to do their job. And my simple pitch to them is be fair. Not to ignore politics. I'm not demanding that uh, Republicans vote for Merrick Garland, but do not stop the process in its tracks. Because if you do, then the ever-escalating, ever-worsening uh, problems uh, behind not just judicial nominees, but nominations generally, uh, are going to continue to make our government uh, more and more dysfunctional. Uh, and it, at some point, it's got to stop. A good place for it to stop is when we're talking about a Supreme Court seat and we have an impeccably qualified candidate who the Republicans themselves have acknowledged uh, is deserving uh, of being on the court. You taking this on the road? Last question. Uh, well, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the case. I'm going to make the case for a fair process. Give Judge Garland a hearing, give him uh, a vote, and look at the qualities of the man. 
Uh, that's what the American people expect. And, and you know, one of the, the most puzzling arguments that I've heard from Mitch McConnell and some other Republicans is this notion that the American people should decide. We, we should let the American people decide uh, as part of this election who gets to fill this seat. Well, in fact, the American people did decide back in 2012 when they elected me President of the United States with sufficient electoral votes. And they also decided that the Republicans would be in the majority. Uh, they didn't say, we're going to decide that you're in charge for three years, and then in the last year, you all take a break. <laughs> they said, no, you're the president for four years, and Mr. McConnell, you're going to be the leader, uh, because we've given you a majority in the Senate. Uh, so the, the, the American people already have decided. They've already weighed in. They will have another opportunity to weigh in so that if there is another vacancy that comes up, the next president will fill that vacancy. Uh, the bottom line is, is that there has not been a coherent argument presented. The real argument is the one that you made, Nina, which is that uh, they don't want a Democrat filling the seat and they are worried and scared about their political base uh, punishing them if they uh, allow a Democrat to fill this seat. Um, but one of the things that's broken down in our politics is a recognition that you don't always get your way 100% of the time. And sometimes in the integrity of the institution and the process and governance and the interests of the American people actually matter more than your short-term politics. They actually matter more than uh, doing what is politically expedient. Uh, and there have been a number of times where, as President of the United States, I've had to do things that I knew were bad politics, but I understood were important to the country or important to the institution of the presidency. Uh, and I would expect that uh, the senators who've been elected uh, by their constituents uh, will, will find in themselves the kind of uh, respect for this incredible democratic experiment that uh, our founders crafted that uh, they're not going to want to see it continue uh, to degenerate into uh, just a bunch of poll-driven, negative ad-driven, uh, polarized name-calling uh, because that's not uh, what made us the greatest country on earth. Mr. President, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. I enjoyed it, Nina. Thank you.